My name is Dennis Culver. Jamie is not with me right now. I'm an instructional support specialist at Iowa State University. Patients on Spiros, there's lots of presentations with Dash and Dot, and maybe Nozobots and Osmo. So today I'm gonna, if you're, if some of this stuff is new to you, I'm gonna talk about it briefly, but what I would like to spend most of our time doing is actually getting some hands-on time with it so you can actually understand it and use it. But I also want us to share, you know, if you have used this in your classroom, please share with everyone so we know how you, how you are using it. Uh, particularly how you are connecting content to it. I think we can all agree that coding is good and it's something that we should have students doing and thinking about, but I think it's pretty far-fetched to say that we're going to have a separate coding class when we figure out how to integrate it into what we're going to do. And that's kind of hard to do. So, if I'm too loud or too quiet, let me know. So I, you guys see this at all? Okay. So why do we go? So I think the two biggest reasons, new literacies. Being literate in today's world means more than being able to read and write. We're saturated, inundated with technology, and we need to be able to understand that technology so it doesn't control us. We also need to encourage students to produce instead of consume. I spoke with someone last night at the social, and they, their quote their school uses is, makers, not takers, which I really like. So how do we get the students to think about, okay, how can I manipulate, use the technology for my own means instead of just doing it with less than we do? And of course, there's all these other great things that come up as well. Logical thinking, algorithms, problem solving, persistence, collaboration, and communication. So if you're brand new to coding, which I'm doubting there's not many here who are, be familiar with block programming. So when you get students started with programming, the easiest thing to do is use block, pro block programming. So Scratch uses block programming. Hopscotch, uh, Scratch Junior, all those things. This is Hopscotch right here. Basically, they don't have to type out their own rights commands. They just arrange them in the correct order to build the program. A few examples here. So there's lots of apps you don't really need any you know, robots for. This first app I'm going to talk more about is kind of apps you can do on iPad or the web, and I'm sure there's Android versions as well. For lower elementary, three great ones, Daisy the Dinosaur, Scratch Junior, and Codable. In order of difficulty, these probably aren't in order. I'd probably say Daisy is the easiest, then Codable, then Scratch Junior would be a more sophisticated option for lower elementary. Upper elementary, another Set of three, Scratch is the standard de facto kind of programming for elementary. It's a great tool. Hopscotch is really nice. And then Tinker as well. I'm less familiar with Tinker, but it's a, another great option. Do any of you use any of these in your classrooms? I use Tinker. Use Tinker? Tinker. What do you do with Tinker? Uh, I'm a technology person, so I mm -hmm. integrate is, I don't have a lot of teachers that want to integrate with me. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're wanting to design a, a, a path through the school and, and eventually get a little like on a tour. So we went to the book. Um, I've done hopscotch before because you get our game design. It, it's nice because it's really like it takes me to the wall. Yeah. I think game design is a big thing with coding. Students love to do that. Any others using any of these apps or tools? Yeah. Scratch. Okay. What are the third grades doing scratch? They have with we have a technology course every day, so. so are they designing just just the video games? The video games. Cool. How many of you are familiar with Hour of Code and Code.org? Most of you? Do you know about Code Studio? If you're not, you should look into it because it's really nice. So our core code, code.org, obviously you're familiar with. Lots of great tutorials for students to go through, and it's tied to their favorite characters, so it's engaging for them. But for teachers, there's this dashboard. You can actually set up a classroom and have students in it and track their progress. And that's Code Studio, and that's free. So you can see where they're at, how they're doing. Excellent place to start and manage your students when you're getting just started in coding. So if you're unfamiliar with that, I encourage you to take a look at it. I think that's a relatively new thing that the website's done.
Osmo, everybody loves Osmo, right? How many have done, have done Osmo coding? Just a few. How many have done other Osmo things? Yep. So the Osmo coding is one of the newer ones. It's really nice because it, again, uses block programming, but it's using physical blocks and you're programming a digital character, so it's a good combination of physical and digital. So with the under students, this is really great. Basically, you'll get a chance to try this out here. This is the run button. You start with this first, and you just snap together magnetically and start stacking commands. You move a character around on the screen, you rotate these arrows, and then you have a step counter. Here this snaps on, tell him how far to go. And it'll show on the screen, you know, a preview, okay, here's where he's going to go before you press start. You can jump, and there's all kinds of obstacles you have to get through. The basic goal is to get to the end of the level. Again, that's for probably younger elementary. Great introductory tool for them to use to start understanding the logic and the algorithm behind the programming and coding, you know, the steps that you can follow. Thank you, Mickey. Another great tool. How many, is, how many of you have used Mickey Mickey before? What are you using Mickey Mickey for? Open makerspace time. Other ideas? We use it to program a Jeopardy buzzer. Cool. Right here, they're using a donut as a space bar. <laughs> if you're not familiar with Mickey Mickey, it's basically a little tiny circuit board. And it's great for programming alternative interfaces. So most of the time, I've seen it used with Scratch. So you can assign, OK, up arrow does this, down arrow does this. And you press something. So I could, the most common example is I would connect five different bananas to the Mickey Mickey using wires. And then the buttons can correspond to those bananas. Because they get that when you touch it, it creates a circuit. So I've seen people create a tin foil piano and all kinds of cool stuff using scratch. So you can make all kinds of weird, funny things that students like to do. Yep, you can use people. In fact, I think it was at the Central Tech Fair, there was a student group that did that. We had, I think, up to like 15 people you know, holding hands the circuit. So now let's talk about robots. So time to talk briefly about some apps in the Osmo, but why robots? They're cool. <laughs> <laughs> but it also makes coding, coding processes easily visible. It makes it an abstract concept more tangible, more concrete for the students. They can actually see what their program is doing. And it can be a bit more motivating for them to actually see something physical that they are controlling so something on the screen. V-Bots, unfortunately I don't have those today. How many have you used these before? With? Do it through, uh, they made a community mm -hmm. in the uh, first grade. Yeah. And they had to go through the community to the different services. So it's like a format and mm -hmm. program, yep. yep so Similar to what this is here, there's a format and they using the buttons on the back, so you don't even need a computer for this one. You just, or an iPad, you just press the buttons in the sequence you want the robot to go, so the students have to think about, okay, where do I want it to go and which buttons do I need to press to get it there. There's lots of alterations on this robot. I've seen mice, I've seen bees, I've seen different things. So that's another great one for young elementary. Before I move on, what kinds of content then does that involve? I got the robot on the mat, I'm telling it where to go, so what? How does that tie into what I'm teaching? Spatial thinking. Sequence. You think about directions. North, south, east, west. Think about math and counting, grid. Any other ideas? How can we tie it to literacy? Do literacy and coding even go together? Yeah, I see a few some people nodding. Yes, how can we tie it to literacy? I think another one of the libraries in our district didn't have these, but something similar, and she had ciphers on the grid. So <coughs> To go to the 
we drew out like, sorry, like the major story events um, in a story and programmed the robots to drive through them in order. Cool. Did you have an example? I was just thinking about uh, teaching the supply chores in the first second. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, excellent examples. So I think one of the easiest thing to do with the robots is do that, you know, tell a story. You tell a story and have the robot drive in the order of events, or even just have them create a, okay, this robot's driving through what looks like a you know, tropical island. What kind of story do you go along with that? What kind of story, what type of events, what kind of landmarks and setting elements can we use there? And then great from there. Puzzlebots. How many are familiar with this? Less people. Okay. Puzzlebots are relatively new, I would say. Um, of all the robots, I think these have the greatest range in terms of uh, skill level. So it can be really basic and simple, but it can also get up to a more complicated level, you know, up into high school almost. At the most basic level, and you'll see on some of the tables, I just got markers and paper. And you can just draw a black line and use specific color codes to make Ozobot do things. So those are the commands. So one code will make him turn around, one code will make him speed up. So you can have students make certain paths, or you can design a path and tell the students, okay, I need you to program the Ozobot to go from here to here, and you have to figure out what commands to use. So that's just marker and paper when you need a device, which is really nice. So it's like drawing and coding together. Next step would be, say, an iPad. You just download the apps that the robot on the iPad and do the same thing, draw, but then you can just throw the codes out. You don't need to actually uh, do the you know, mark red, blue, and green or something. You just drag the code out. And then also Blockly is the most advanced. And still, there'd be, it could be similar to Scratch at the most basic level. You can actually set it on an iPad or hold it up to your computer screen. It'll splash a series of lights and code the Autobot for you. So we'll read the light flashes, so you can actually get it to do your program. And we'll see an example of that at that table. Okay. Sphero. Who does Sphero? Lots of people. What are we using Sphero for? Um, we have students do a painting with them before. And Obviously, Sphero has a lot to do with speed, motion, force, friction, all those basic concepts of movement. They do a lot with that. You can also just, it's a really great way for them to, I've seen a lot of teachers set up obstacle courses for students where they'll set down tape lines or objects and they're having the students program their Spheros to go through or over things and get to the end. And I've even seen Seen in paint, I've seen in water as well, they're waterproof, so people will build attachments and there's a chariot add on so they can make different kinds of contraptions for the sphere of power. Dash and dot are probably my favorite just because I think they're cool. Dash is down here and you'll get to try him out a bit. He's the bigger one. Dot's the little one, is his partner. And what makes these two unique, I mean, you can program them using block programming. There's also another app for probably younger students. But the two can interact with each other, they can sense and see each other, so you can do some different things there. And you can also have students record themselves with Dash and Dot. So I've seen examples of Dash being used in literacy where there's, you know, similar to what you mentioned before, there being a timeline of events or a story. Dash drives to the correct spot and a student, the student's voice record, you know, says what that event is and what happens in the story at that time. So again, as we're going through some of the examples today, I want you to think about what's the content behind this, how is this tied to math, science, literacy, art, 
a lot of these tools have, and I brought a lot of them with me, you know, these teacher's guides for this stuff. Good place to get started. They're not going to be exhaustive. And again, it's, all of this is very contextually based, so you've got to make sure it fits with your classroom. Obviously, coding and robotics lends itself to the STEM topics, but like I've said earlier, we want to make sure that we're connecting to other things too, because they do fit together. So literacy, art, music, with making, making. And try to connect content areas, make it interdisciplinary. It doesn't have to be so siloed. I think we do that a lot in K-12, and it's not just how it is in the real world. So some more examples. So a scratch, you know, tell a story. Have Dash make a masterpiece, make a Jello controller with Mickey Makey. And this is one of my favorites. We have a reading clinic at Iowa State where we have elementary students come in and we have undergraduates help them with their reading. And one of the activities that they did was read code right. So they're reading a book somehow connected to coding or robotics and they have an experience with the robots and coding and they write about their experience afterwards. So it's kind of a workflow going together there. So I thought it was a really nice way to do it. Any questions? I know I kind of flew through those and I think you guys had experience with a lot of this stuff. What questions do you have? Any other great examples of how you're using coding in your schools? Thanks for the experts. Okay. So, like I said, I'd like to spend a good chunk of time letting you actually experience some of this stuff and play with it. That's the first step: is you got to understand it yourself before you can think about how it ties into your curriculum. So. I've uh, tried to spread it out as much as possible. You should have something at your tables. We have one group going over there already. It's perfect. <laughs> so yeah, Ozobots, and I've got the reference sheets with the Ozobots. And make sure you try and get around, especially about one if you're not familiar with it. I mean, if you're, if you're in the Sphero, maybe you don't worry about going to Sphero. But here's the Ozobot code. So you know, these are the color sequences we've used to do these commands. We've got Ozo, I'll unlock that for you back there for the iPad. Osmo coding, you got two of those. Spheros, I've got the Sphero track in the back. I've got two Spheros, I've got one on this table and one on the back counter. If you need help waking those up and getting them connected to the iPad, I can do that for you. But what I usually have students do, and I don't know if you guys have experienced the same thing, what I find with Spheros is that they need to be contained somehow. You need to give the students a goal when they're in the of the place, they're going to get lost. So what I did is I designed a poster back there with several different tracks with a range of difficulty. So red would be the easiest, and yellow would be the hardest. And I have the students program on that, so they're kind of contained to that area. It's not perfect, but it works pretty well. We've got another Ozobot set up here, and we've got Dash and Dot up here. With Dash, what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you program him to clear off the balls on this grid. I've got my cell phone attached to him so I can record what he's doing as he's doing it. He's got a bulldozer attached to him right now, so we can push things out of the way. And we've got Dot over there if you want to play with her too. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> They'll talk to you. <laughs> what questions do you have? Otherwise, I'll let you. I'll be walking around and I'll let you explore a little bit and I'll answer questions as I go. Okay. I'm start walking around. Okay. 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 Okay.
90 degree turns, but if you want to start talking about angles and stuff, too, about the curve and the angles and stuff, Yeah. Uh, there's a spot on the side. This one's just the tutorial. Too late. Right. I think it's all better than better. I one more. I had to do it first part. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah I was really tough to do it with it. Yeah. And then when you wake it up, it comes up. So zigzag will actually skip the line, so you can draw.